What's up everybody, this is Battle 3 John 97 here giving you the July to October gaming pickups plus video. And the plus is added into gaming pickups because it's not going to just be about physical video games anymore. Granted, the main focus of these videos, including this one, is still going to be about the video games, my thoughts, my impressions, and even a somewhat mini review on each game that I got. But I want to showcase more than just video games in these kinds of videos. I want to showcase the DVDs, the Blu-rays, even the Japanese books and translated Japanese manga volumes that are released in the West. So without further ado, to get this over with, because this may be a 20 plus video, so brace yourself for it. <laughs> Let's get into the video games, because that's the main focus of these video. So yeah, just a fair warning, most of the games that I got from July to September, I was scraping the bottom of the barrel, because before I got my eventual current job, which is very, very good, definitely worth it to stay throughout the year or so. Uh, I was just getting a lot of anime games. Anime games that I wanted ever since I was a kid, to even anime game that I got as a child, but then had to be sold for eventual collections like PS3 and PlayStation 4. So this is kind of like, how do I put the word here? Um, fulfilling what I wanted as a kid, but looking back at it now, I shouldn't really do that, but it's already too late, I already got the games. So let's start with the Nintendo GameCube games that I got, three of them from July to October. So let's start with the series of games that I wanted as a kid, but I didn't get the eventual chance until I got a sequel on the Nintendo Wii. And that is the Naruto Clash of Ninja games on GameCube, the original and Clash of Ninja 2. Now, I definitely were to make a comparison to the Clash of Ninja games, it would be like a kind of a watered-down version of Namco Bandai's Tekken, which is kind of funny because eventually Namco Bandai would actually be making the current Naruto games that we are enjoying, like the Ultimate Ninja Storm games on PlayStation 4, Xbox One, and PC. So it's kind of weird to see that a, a series made by Tomy, um, also a production toy manufacturer in Japan and even in the States, would be making these kinds of Tekken-like games than Namco Bandai would for the eventual Naruto games. Now, Clash of Ninja, um, the first original Clash of Ninja game on GameCube, I gotta say, if you can find this for less than $5, you got a deal, but anything beyond $5 is a steal from your wallet because Clash of Ninja 1 lacks any essential content. Like, the content you're gonna get in Clash of Ninja 1 is from the beginning of Naruto to the end of the Sabuza arc, which is like one arc <laughs> out of the entirety of Naruto. I mean, yeah, Rock Lee is in the front cover and he is a playable character, but you have to play the story mode twice in order to unlock him. And trust me, the story mode is bare bones, it's boring, and you kind of have that early English voice acting from the Naruto series, which is not bad if you're watching the anime, but they really need to put much heart and soul into the into the video game. And it kind of be cringeworthy at times. But overall, if you can t um, turn down your brain and play with a bunch of friends, the Clash of Ninja games, the original and especially Clash of Ninja 2, are exceptional games to play if you're a Naruto fan. So Clash of Ninja, if you can find this for less than $5 and it's actually in a good quality with the case itself, you did a good deal. And in that, you might as well just get its sequel. Whew. You might as well get its sequel, Clash of Ninja 2, on the Nintendo GameCube. It includes all the content from the beginning of Naruto up until the Chunin Exams arc with Naruto fighting against Gaara in his like Jinjiriki form. So, you definitely have a lot more content. Aside from the story bits, you actually have a four-player co-op mode. Not just like in a 2D... You have like a free roam 3D environment being able to go around. Not not, not, not like in a fast-paced 3D um, roam as like in the Ultimate Ninja Storm game, but it's still free roam enough for you to actually play with friends. It's a clusterfuck, that's be sure. Being able to fight against three other friends like in local co-op in this game but overall if you can get that it's quite fun it's definitely worth it to have in your nart in your <laughs> it's definitely worth it to have in your gamecube collection and if you're a naruto fan definitely check this out definitely you get this over the original uh naruto clash ninja and of course the final gamecube game i want to showcase is a game that i have nostalgic memories for and definitely replaying it is not a bad game but it's beginning is it has a spike difficulty that i'll say and that, of course, is Konami's Yu-Gi-Oh! The False Bound Kingdom for the Nintendo GameCube. Now, of course, I got this used, so I didn't get the three limited edition official cards that Konami back then, or even, I think now, <laughs> packaged as three limited edition cards used for the actual trading card game of Yu-Gi-Oh! Now, of course, funny enough, I still have those three cards with me in my binder from my old copy of False Bound Kingdom. So, I didn't find much of an incentive to actually get this brand new. 
if I already got the cards. So got this used anyway. Um, the manual is still there along with the disc, so that's all I care about when I get these games used on Amazon, eBay, or even in GameStop. So, I'm going all over the place here. So, you get the Vols Valkyrie, if I were to make a comparison, it's kind of like this over the, sh um, over the shoulder, over the shoulder, over the top, like, strategy game, where you move about your characters and monsters, throughout these kinds of parts in the kingdom. Like, basically the plot of Yu-Gi-Oh! The False Bound Kingdom is kind of an original one. Yu-Gi and his gang um, go into this virtual world that isn't from Kaiba Corporation, but some other corporation made for this video game. Even though um, Kaiba's assistant throughout the anime appears as an employee because he quit Kaiba Corporation. I don't know why, but just had some familiar characters for this Yu-Gi-Oh! storyline. And granted, there's no voice acting for the English from four kids actors or even the Japanese side of things. So you just got text bubbles. But the music kind of like substitute the voice acting because the music in False Bound Kingdom, along with another Yu-Gi-Oh! game on PlayStation 2, the Duels of the Rose, has to be one of the most underrated soundtracks in a video game I've ever heard. Much better than any regular anime game would be. Like it's really good. Like go on YouTube, type it in Duels of the Rose or the False Bound Kingdom, and you're definitely going to have tons and tons of hours of really good music to listen to. So, yeah, I'm getting tracked from the gameplay itself. The gameplay is that of a strategy game. At first, it's quite easy. You just mash the A button or switch with Celtic Guardian or Karibo or any of these other monsters from the first generation of Yu-Gi-Oh!, which was the original Yu-Gi-Oh!, to go about this virtual world, to be able to beat the game in order for Yu-Gi, um, Joey, and all the other, um, all of, all of his friends to get out of this virtual world. So it's kind of like it's taking the plot of this filler arc um, in the first season of Yu-Gi-Oh! Where Yu-Gi and his friends and Kaiba, um, they're, in, they're stuck in this virtual world and they have to like defeat like the corporate heads of Kaiba Corporation in order to stop them from taking over the company from Kaiba. So it's kind of like taking that filler arc and making it a video game of its own. But instead of Kaiba Corporation, some other generic corporation made for this game itself. And yeah, you get to use the Egyptian God cards, Obelisk the Tormentor, Slifer the Sky Dragon, and the Wing Dragon of Ra. And I gotta say, their destructive force is the biggest highlight of this game. You can get through the sloggy text and everything about it. it it's a fun it's a fun blast. You get to play the campaign mode three times as Yugi Moto, Seto Kaiba, and Joey Wheeler. So at least you have enough fun to be able to listen to the music so many times and even use the Egyptian God cards. Because once you get those Egyptian God cards, you basically win the game. You basically won the game because they're so fucking destructive as all hell that it basically is a dream come true. Being able to have that orchestrated epic music with one of the god cards attack, it's something to behold. And definitely is worth it in your game collection if you are a fan of Yu-Gi-Oh! like I am. So yeah, Yu-Gi-Oh! The False Bound Kingdom, definitely a game to own in your collection. Especially if you're a fan of strategy games. And yeah, um, along with the Naruto Clash of Ninja games on GameCube, I actually have a Wii game. And this is a Wii game that I had in my previous Wii collection, and I actually loved it back in 2007 or 2008. Some what year that this game was released in, and that's Naruto Clash of Ninja Revolution for the Nintendo Wii. Now, before we had Clash of Ninja 2 in Japan, there was Clash of Ninja 3 and 4 and I think a 5 for Nintendo GameCube that followed all the way from the entirety of the first part of Naruto. And Clash of Ninja Revolution is kind of like um, Geki Otosen, that's the Japanese name, of Clash of Ninja 3 on GameCube. So basically it's kind of like Clash of Ninja 3, but ported onto the Wii with some additions here and there. So just like with Clash of Ninja 2 be from the beginning of Naruto up until the Chuyun exams of Naruto fighting against Gara in his Jinjiriki form, this goes up against um, from the beginning of Naruto up until Sasuke and Naruto encounters Itachi Uchiha. So definitely there's tons of more characters to be had and I gotta say the motion controls is not that bad to use for this game itself. It definitely is worth it in your Wii collection if you especially love fighting games. And definitely, for a Naruto fan, this is quite good to have. I can't really say about Clash of Ninja Revolution 2, which has an original storyline. doesn't really follow up until the final part, the final arc of Part 1 of Naruto. But definitely, I may get it eventually, because I might as well. I can't really stop at these Naruto games. <laughs> and they're quite cheap nowadays, especially with my, um, the earnings that I get at my current job. So... Just like with the gameplay of the original Clash of Ninja games on GameCube, it's kind of an enhanced version of it using the Wii motion controls of being able to move around the environments. And yeah, 
And, you, and along with the nunchuck and the classic controller, you can actually use the GameCube controller. So you have the same kind of um, control scheme as in the GameCube Clash of Ninja games for Revolution. So definitely, if you're so used to controls for the original Clash of Ninja games, you're definitely going to be right at home if you plug in a GameCube controller for Revolution on the Wii. So definitely, if you're a Naruto fan and you like fighting games on the Wii, you need something different, Clash of Ninja Revolution is definitely worth it in the collection. And yeah, that's it for the Nintendo side of things. I haven't gotten any Xbox games ever since July, so <laughs> that's telling you how much I use my 360 nowadays. So definitely, here are the PlayStation games. One PS3 game and one PlayStation 4 game that I got for me. Now this was a great, great find in the Goodwills that I always go to for these um, gaming pickup videos. And this I got for $5 plus taxes. The Game of the Year edition of Little Big Planet for PlayStation 3, the original Little Big Planet. And I gotta say, compared to the Game of the Year edition that Sony um, shot out um, after this Game of the Year edition, like say Uncharted 2 and 3, where there's a code voucher for any first time buyers to get the DLC for this Game of the Year edition, instead of someone like me who bought it used and can't really get all the codes unless I buy everything separate on the PlayStation Store. This one actually has all of the DLC contents, at least up until that point of the Game of the Year edition's release on the disc. There's no code voucher. You don't have to buy anything separate if you want to for the original Little Big Planet. And it's really cool because they advertise in the back of the box that you have these free add-on content. And these are the contents from Metal Gear Solid 4 Guns of the Patriots. So of course, from up until where I currently stopped with Little Big Planet, I actually used the old Solid Snake outfit. And it's really cool being able to have all these costumes and everything from these licensed um, franchises. And what's really cool about Little Big Planet as a franchise overall is that if you buy the DLC for the first Little Big Planet, you can actually transfer it to Little Big Planet 2, Little Big Planet 3, I think maybe the PSP Little Big Planet version, the Vita version of Little Big Planet. So definitely, it's a con it's a game where the content from the previous versions actually does transfer to the other um, games, the other sequels, other installments, other ports, other versions of it. So definitely. It's quite a steal, and it's quite good to have in the collection. And if I were to make a comparison to Little Big Planet, at least for a relative um, new game like it, it would be like Super Mario Maker for the Nintendo Wii U. But unlike Mario Maker, where it has the actual controls for platform with Mario, with Little Big Planet, you have Sackboy um, with his floaty controls, kind of even more floaty than, say, Princess Peach or Luigi's jumping in the Mario games itself. But overall, Little Big Planet isn't about platforming and jumping. It's secondary because it's kind of floating, and kind of shitty, to be honest with you. The main draw with Little Big Planet, these games in general, is the content that you can create, the content you can buy and use it to create other levels. And it's exceptional with the first game, being able to create your own platforming levels, making platform versions of, say, Final Fantasy VII, the Metal Gear games is really creative of how this community be able to go out of it. And all the other installments like Little Big Planet 2 even goes beyond just the platforming genre. You can make shooter genres, you can make all these other kind of stuff. So definitely Little Big Planet is at least something to own for your PlayStation collection. And definitely, definitely was worth the steal that I got in Goodwills from like $5.99 plus taxes. So Little Big Planet, have it in your collection if you don't if you already got it to begin with. And yeah. That's it for what I got. This is the game that I got for my current job. I paid $65. This was included from the tax um, in New York State. So definitely, um, it's a big pricey thing. But I definitely think that it's worth the $65 that I paid for. And that, of course, is the day one edition of Dragon Quest Builders by Square Enix for the PlayStation 4. And I got to say right here, right now, as somebody who wasn't the biggest fan of Minecraft, even though I kept trying playing playing the game, multiple times and multiple platforms like the Xbox 360, the PlayStation 3, and I think even the PlayStation 4, my brother downloaded it in the PlayStation Store. I gotta say, this hooked me from the very beginning when I played the demo of it on PS4 and PlayStation Vita, and I couldn't wait to get the full game itself at GameStop. And yeah, I'm still playing this game. I'm like in the second chapter of the story mode, and I'm definitely still going to be able to play this up until the release of Final Fantasy XV, which I already pre-ordered on Amazon, so you're definitely going to have my impressions or review of Final Fantasy XV because <laughs> I definitely have something to say about Final Fantasy XV as a whole, maybe another video, something, something, something. So anyhow, if I were to make an impressions of Dragon Quest Builders, 
it'll be for people who weren't the biggest fans of Minecraft, because Minecraft is like a total freedom game. There's no objections, you make the objections yourself, and you go through the environments and do whatever you want, either through survival mode or this um, free mode, where you don't have to deal with fighting food and having to deal with the monsters in the world. Granted, that's the same thing with Dragon Quest Builders, but the difference between Dragon Quest Builders and Minecraft is that Dragon Quest Builders has objection. You can't play free mode or survival mode in Dragon Quest Builders. You have to play through at least the first chapter of the story mode. And the story mode is kind of generic as you would for a, a Japanese expire um, European RPG. It's kind of like a sequel to the original Dragon Quest in a way, where the hero, he defeated the Dragon Lord or the evil Demon Lord himself. And yeah, things just happen. Everybody in the world is kind of like in this dystopian apocalyptic world and you the builder i forgot the name of your character but you the builder awaken from your slumber you're either dead or some god or goddess resurrects you from your grave and you try to save the world from this demon lord himself by building these kinds of cities these kinds of safe houses for people that you find in the environment and everything about it and yeah it's kind of generic but it's kind of enthralling in a way because you're kind of like this demigod you're this people's last hope you're this kind of um protector in a way making these kind of fortresses of being able to protect them from these monsters because once nighttime falls the monsters will come and attack your people and attack your base so you have to prepare yourself in multiple areas of the uh, of your base itself now, there is some negatives I have to say about Dragon Quest Builders is that there's no local or online co-op. So let's say you wanted your friend or buddy um, to help you build your structure or help them build their structure. You can't really do that local or online. And Minecraft, at least the GIMP console versions, actually has that feature. So it's kind of sad that Square Enix or the developers within Square Enix didn't really thought of having these local or online co-op for Dragon Quest Builders. And also a negative that they did not bring up up until the last text bubble of the first chapter. Because when you're playing through story mode, everything that you do when building your own fort doesn't really matter. Because once that chapter is over, you go into these other world. It's basically like playing a brand new game because each chapter is like one game in its entirety with its own set of story mode and its own set of characters that you have to like fix their problems or whatnot. I didn't know about this up until my brother who was playing this game before me actually went to chapter 2 and said that oh um, this whole fourth that you're doing is not going to matter at the end of the road and I didn't get any instruction out of it like there's no there's no manual to be said in the back of the box and nowhere is it said in the game itself up until the last text bubble so I gotta say this for anybody who is curious enough to have Dragon Quest Builders and play it through a rental or buy it don't do anything like big in the story mode just do every single objective you can in order to go to free mode and then go crazy as all hell with your, with your inventions and all that so yeah I'm, I'm rambling about it's probably like maybe 10 or 15 minutes at this point of the video so Dragon Quest Builders, I may do a review of it once I finish all the chapters of the game. I'm currently in Chapter 2. I gotta say, it's definitely worth the price of a mission for $60 full dollars. I don't know about the PlayStation Vita version, but from what I played in the demo, it kind of slows down and it's kind of a game version of the PS4 um, version of Dragon Quest Builders. But yeah, I'm kind of tempted to have it on the go. And definitely Dragon Quest Builders is worth it on your PlayStation 4 collection and if you're a fan of the Dragon Quest series as a whole. So now, with all the games of the way, let's go into the other pickups that I got from July to October 26th. Now that the gaming part of the Gaming Pickups Plus video is done for, time to go into the side attractions, the other things that I got from July to October 2016. And boy, I got a lot of books, a lot of Japanese books, a lot of Japanese translated to English books of manga in particular, because I love manga. And considering how my last video, the manga collection from 2012, is severely outdated, I might do a manga collection video sometime next year. Because of the rate that I'm going in, I'm gonna be, <laughs> I'm gonna be like completing like two or three series at this point with how many fucking books I've been buying for this medium that I love of manga. And particularly, I've been buying these Japanese weekly Shonen Jump magazines from Kino Kuni. Now, in Kino Kuni, for like every Sunday or so, they get these and other Japanese magazines in through airmail. And for each issue that I have of Weekly Shonen Jump, 
these issues in particular I get for five dollars no taxes included so that's really cool so I'll help now you may be wondering why the hell do I even have Japanese fucking um, weekly show and jump issues if I already have tons of space with the American Fins Media show and jump issues that Fins Media did before until they cease and desist that for their digital weekly show and jump series well for one is each issue of Shonen Jump has a particular chapter, like the final chapter of a series that I like. For this one, for instance, um, 36-37, this issue has the final chapter of Nisekoi. And I love Nisekoi. I particularly love Nisekoi. So the deer is in my heart. And it kind of sad that it kind of ended and didn't really have a front cover for it, the ending of it. But I got it anyway. Uh, final chapter of Nisekoi for that chapter. And of course, the final chapter of Bleach, which it also didn't have a front cover and is on the side of the issue itself. And of course, they were promoting the Love Rush series that replaced Nisekoi in the next chapter. But you gotta say, if you like the kind of thing like the Monster Me or whatever monster series, then you might like um, Love Rush. But yeah, I'm not a really particular fan of it. And of course, seeing that this might be a valuable collection in the future I bought two of the same issues this one is an open copy of it and a sealed copy that I have not opened yet and you can see right here the airmail for $4.99 did not pay taxes for each of them so that's really cool and of course this issue issue 42 of Weekly Shonen Jump includes the final chapter of a legacy franchise that started in 1976 and that's Kochi Kami. And what's really cool about this cover of this issue of Weekly Shonen Jump is that it includes a poster. Well, not particularly a poster, but actually a spread cover up of multiple artists within Shonen Jump uh, making a celebration for um, Kochi Kami as a whole. Like literally, okay, this is the poster itself. The poster for this franchise itself and what's really cool is that it includes the final chapter of Kochi Kami, but also includes the first chapter of Kochi Kami from 1976 in full color, which you can see right here. And I also have the first volume of Kochi Kami, but I'm kind of spoiling ahead of myself for these other pickups <laughs> video. So yeah, for two issues of 42, and of course the latest Shonen Jump issue that I bought is the latest, well not the latest, this is the last week's issue. And that's issue 47 that includes a One Piece cover-up. And what's really cool about this Weekly Shonen Jump issue is that it has two posters. The first poster, which is the first page of the issue, is a poster of the cover spread of the latest chapter of One Piece. Not the latest chapter. Last week's chapter of One Piece. And it's really cool because in the in digital scans, like in scanlation sites and through the official uh, Fins Media uh, Shonen Jump issue, it just is like a cover spread. But in here is an actual poster. And what's really cool about this is the second poster is actually promoting the Death Note movie, the um, Light Up the New World in Japan. And this is the poster itself. It's pretty cool as all hell. And I think I might just stop buying these issues unless it's a issue that has a particular series that is ending. Like let's say um, One Piece for instance. If One Piece ends by the time I'm like 60 years old, I may get the last um, issue maybe three copies of the same issue because I'm just kind of like that and yeah this is like <laughs> three wait four to five weekly shonen jump issues in Japanese and they're like the size of a phone book and the page quality is like that of a phone book like the ink isn't solid there's no like black solid ink to it and the covers can really like tear up real easy compared to the Vince Media's shonen jump issues back then so I have to take extra care for it. And it really does take up much space with my manga collection. And yeah, speaking of manga collection, here is the collection of manga volumes that I got from September and October because I bought so much shit. Look at this. Look at this for how much I fucking bought. So let's start from the top of this pile itself. The first four volumes of Full Metal Alchemist. Volume 1, Volume 2... Volume 3 and Volume 4, which I still have in shrink wrap because I'm currently um, in the middle of Volume 3. I'm taking my sweet time with this series itself because, well, I'm not going to spoil it, but if you already know, um, if you follow me on Facebook and Twitter, you might know why I bought these issues of issues, these volumes of Full Metal Alchemist itself. So, yeah, the first four volumes of Full Metal Alchemist, 
the first two volumes of One Punch Man. Um, I'm still in the middle of the first volume of One Punch Man, but I bought the second one just in case. If I do finish the first volume from New York Comic Con and the Kino Kuni booth, because I can't really stop buying from Kino Kuni. God help me. And also from Kino Kuni, the first two volumes of Assassination Classroom, Volume 1 and Volume 2. They're still in shrink wrap because I'm currently um, addicted with Full Metal Alchemist and a particular franchise that you might see so much fucking pickups from this video itself. So yeah, they're still in shrink wrap. When I finish with one of these series, I'm going to head straight into Assassination Classroom. And then, of course, it's also in shrink wrap. Like, most of these fucking pickups that I have, they're in shrink wrap. And that's the first volume of the Baroque Works 3-in-1 one, one Piece volume. That includes volumes 13 to 15. As I got the other 3-in-1 volumes from the One Piece, East Blue, um, Arc, Saga, whatever you want to say. And yeah, it's still in shrink wrap because I'm still um, currently reading Full Metal Alchemist. And this other series, which I'm going to be showing off right now. Now, I got the first Jojonium volume of Part 1, JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, last year in New York Comic Con. And since then, I didn't really continue on from Part 1 itself, up until I got my job in, well, I'm not going to say the company's name itself, but from the end of August to the beginning of September, I've been currently getting every single Jojonium volume that is of JoJo, and even getting the first volume the first Jojonian volume of Part 3 Stardust Crusaders from New York Comic Con, which I do recommend you go to my New York Comic Con 2016 experience slash pickup video so you can see that along with other um, things that I got for free and paid swag itself. So let's get it out of the way. Here are the remaining volumes of Part 1 of the Jojonian edition. Part 2 with Dio Brando. Wait, no, this is the third volume. The second um, Jojonian edition volume of Jojo Part 1 with separately then Dio Brando and the front covers. And then we get to part two itself, Battle Tendency. We got Joseph Joestar, Best Jojo, um, Lisa Lisa in the second cover art, and the third volume is with Sepoli, Caesar Sepoli. And I have to say, it's still in shrink wrap because I've currently finished the second Jojonium volume of part two, and I'm currently reading Full Metal Alchemist, so once I finish the fourth volume of Full Metal Alchemist, I'm going to open this sucker up, and once I finish with the third volume, I'll get the final volume of part two, Battle Tendency, with Cars as the main, as the character in the cover itself. So, yeah, I got so much fucking JoJo books. But also, the first volume of Stardust Crusaders, as I mentioned a few minutes ago. This is the one that I got from the Finns Media booth in New York Comic Con. Uh, today's November 1st, so you can definitely find this in your local bookstores, local comic store. Get it. Because from what I've read of the first chapter, compared to the graphic novel release that Finns Media did back in 2005, this is much better translated. And if you did read the subs from Crunchyroll, you're definitely going to be accustomed to the, the Jodium release than the graphic novel one itself. So definitely, and it has a nice cover itself, the blue really contrasts with Jotaro's um, green coat itself. So definitely worth it if you're a JoJo fan. So yeah, that's the English side of things. This was crazy enough for me, because with the Japanese Weekly Shonen Jump issues that I bought, I also bought Japanese Tankabons. And Tankabons would be the equivalent of a single graphic novel book. And boy god, I got like nine fucking Japanese Tankabons. In Japanese, no English required. And of course, since I was celebrating Kochi Kami Zen by getting two of the same issues for its last chapter, I got the first chapter, the first chapter, the first volume of Kochi Kami from 1976 itself. And definitely you can tell from the art style compared to how it is now with how goofy it is. So yeah, the first volume of Kochi Kami, there's no way in hell I'm getting the other 199 volumes for this thing. No survey. But of course, as a JoJo fan, I was crazy enough, and of course Kinokuni had like some, if not most, of the Jojo Tankabons themselves, and even the Japanese Jojonian editions themselves. So, I have the first volume of each part of Jojo's Bizarre Adventure. Part 1, Phantom Blood. Part 2, Battle Tendency. Uh, part 3, Stardust Crusaders, which is kind of cheating because Volume 12 is technically the first volume of part three because the last chapter of volume 12 is the first chapter of Stardust Crusaders. So yeah, Araki didn't know how to fucking end each part, <laughs> each part of Jojo up until part six. So it's definitely crazy. Um, part four, Diamond is Unbreakable. 
Part 5, Vento Audio. Part 6, uh, Stone Ocean, right over here. Uh, part 7, Steel Ball Run. And of course, the current uh, JoJo part that is still in circulation with an Ultra Jump, and that is JoJo Line itself. So yeah, all of these fucking books, all of these fucking books in English and Japanese can really, really mess with a man in his psyche. So <laughs> hopefully I'll end this video because I'm sweaty as all hell and just having all this really makes you crazy. <laughs> so yeah, all of the games, the books themselves, I even got some DVDs and Blu-rays. Most of it is anime, but there are some that used to be in theaters itself. So let's start with the DVD, which I have three DVDs themselves. The first being the save edition of Birdie the Mighty Decor, the complete series with episodes 1 through 26. Now the reason I even got this is because I remember seeing the first three episode, episodes of Birdie through illegal websites <laughs> back in the day. And of course, since this, along with the other series that Aniplex wanted the rights for fun animation, I did everything I can to get this before Aniplex would even do some kind of stupid limited edition run of their franchise itself. So, yeah, it's still in shrink wrap because I was doing my Halloween slash October marathon. So, it's already November, so I might as well open this and watch the series from beginning to end. And, of course, another franchise that Aniplex wanted the rights from Fun Animation, and that was Full Moon Alchemist, the 2003 um, adaptation in Brotherhood from 2009. So, Kino Kuni actually had some of these um, DVDs and Blu-rays that I bought from them. Now, of course, currently Kino Kuni only has the latest movie of Full Moon Alchemist that Funimation still has the rights to. I don't know why Aniplex didn't get it, but whatever. So, of course, the premium OVA collection of Full Moon Alchemist, the 2003 adaptation. I still have it in shrink wraps. I don't know if I really want to open it because this might be rare in the future, but whatever. And, of course... The first set of Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood in shrink wraps on DVD. Now, of course, Right Stuff has the Blu-ray of it still in stock, but I don't know if I want to pay $50 for the same thing again in HD. And, of course, I don't really want to open this because this thing, along with the other sets and the other um, part collection, whatever Funimation did for Brotherhood, is fucking expensive in the second-hand market. And there's no way in hell I'm going to degrade the quality of an already good series, of, uh, an already good adaptation of Full Metal Alchemist itself. So definitely it's going to be in the bottom of the drawer, shrink wrap itself in good condition. <laughs> and we're now going to be in the final part of this video, the Blu-rays. Now let's start with the Blu-rays that I got immediately. So once I got my big paycheck, my big um, double shift paycheck, I wanted to get the original Full Metal Alchemist. So of course I got the complete series on Blu-ray. Episodes 1 through 51 of the 2003 adaptation with all the bonus special features, whatever you get. I'm currently in the second disc of it, watching it in English. And once I finish the second disc part of it in English, rewatch it in Japanese because that's how I roll nowadays. <laughs> so definitely, um, it's a quite refreshing pace being able to watch the original 2003 adaptation, which I think is not as bad as people make it out to believe. So then we got the first Full Metal Alchemist movie. Full Metal Alchemist the movie, The Conqueror Shambhala on Blu-ray. I think this and the complete series of the 2003 adaptation is still in stock in Amazon. So you better get that shit before it runs out and Aniplex does whatever. So yeah. And then I got the Steelbook edition of Deadpool from Best Buy. This is still in shrink wrap because I was doing my Halloween slash October marathon. So definitely I'm going to be plopping this open and watching a very, very good superhero movie. And then I actually got this yesterday in October 31st. So this is a great thing that Right Stuff did. So, um, of course, they had a Blu-ray um, fun animation sale. And I wanted to get this series for quite some time in my home video release um, collection. And that's the first season of Yu Yu Hakusho on Blu-ray with episodes 1 through uh, 31 or something like that. Um, it's still in shrink wrap because I got this yesterday and I was watching my horror movies in a marathon. So definitely this is going to be plopping into my PS3 and PS4. And then, of course, um, normally I wouldn't be getting this. I would have gotten a collection with like episodes 1 through 30 or 40 or whatever. But Vince Media it currently released the first set of Hunter x Hunter on Blu-ray and DVD. And of course, 
Uh, the reason I even got this from Right Stuff is because there was a pre-order bonus for the first set of Hunter Hunter, and that was getting an actual Hunter license from Vince Media and Right Stuff themselves. And what's really cool about the Hunter license itself because there's a nice quality to it. It doesn't feel smushed. There's nothing to it. And in the back, it has the has the caption "Not for sale" or "Not a license to kill." So you definitely know there's a ton of cheek way for the Hunter license being the equivalent of being able to kill somebody in the manga and the animes of Hunter Hunter themselves. And of course, just like with Yu Yu Hakusho, it's still in shrink wraps. I have not opened it yet. But of course, maybe sometime in my November Gaming Pickups Plus video, I may get the Best Buy Steelbook Edition of the first set because it looks really cool as all hell. And I didn't even know that up until the time I even got this shipped to me. So yeah, that's it for the Gaming Pickups Plus video from July to October 2016. I hope you, can tr um, hope you enjoyed this video itself. Like, fair, subscribe. What's the pickup that you liked that I got from July to October in the comment section below? This is Battlefield Joe 97. Catch you guys later.